Hi, my name is Steve Young, aka Headflux. I'm stoked to be here in Tel Aviv to give a presentation here at BPM College on audio alchemy and music production. Okay, so guys, welcome to the workshop or whatever we call it. Mm -hmm. uh, Everyone here is familiar with uh, Steve, with Headflux? Okay, for those of you that are not, or for the ones that are watching this, basically, this is Steve, AKA Headflux, probably one of the most uh, influential and leading and uh, co-founding, uh, I can even say, figures of the global uh, down-tempo and bass music and psy bass uh, spheres, genres. Uh, with long, long lasting history in this field um, and various collaborations with vast, uh, I don't know, uh, artists such as Grouch and Mr. Bill and Lucas mm -hmm. and many, many more yeah. along the way. And well, welcome. Thank you. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for coming out. Yeah. Okay, so basically, we had some few questions, mm -hmm. you know, to ask you before you continue with your uh, workshop with uh, yeah. whatever, you know, <laughs> you have to deliver. So we'll get right to it. Uh, first of all, Steve. Mm -hmm. Basically, what were your very first steps in the music industry and uh, or the musical sphere in general, and what actually attracted you to it to yeah. deal with music? Well, it's been it's been just a lifelong endeavor. You know, I had synthesizers and learned piano when I was a kid, and uh, then so I got my first computer around age twelve and started making like music, like I was hearing in video games. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how I first started trying to replicate the sort of sound I was hearing in you know video games of the early nineties and that kind of thing. And then, of course, you know, the computers just got faster and faster, and the software got better and better, and uh, I just continued that as a hobby through the 90s and uh, into the noughties. Um, and uh, went, during that time, I went to university and studied physics at a, a master's degree and a PhD. Um, and then I came out of that. I had a job for five years. But uh, during that time, I, I started the Headflux project. And um, yeah, I released my first record. And then that, that went down really well. And I did a lot of personal work to kind of figure out what my real purpose in life was. And uh, you know, all, all signs were pointing towards music. Um, and so I eventually got the courage to just quit my job and say, all right, I'm just going to put everything I got into oh, wow. music now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that was not until the age of 32. So, yeah, I was kind of a late, a late starter in, uh, in sort of full-time music. Uh, and, um, yeah. Late starter is the right term, but here you are. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, well, it took me that long to figure out that I just had to devote my life to music. You know, it was, I'd done all these other things, but, you know, music was just always there from the beginning. It was always my favorite thing to do. And, uh, yeah, but I never, when I was young, I never thought it was something I could realistically do. Because you sort of see like pop stars and people like that, and you think, well, is that, you know, do I even want that kind of a life? You know, probably not. But then the underground scene is this kind of beautiful, like mid, midway ground where it's all very intimate and uh, it's not, not, not like the mainstream music scene. Yeah. And, and that just sort of welcomed me more and more. And as I release more music, it, it unlocks like, you know, doors, you know, you, you, the world can seem like a small place and then you start releasing music and then things just start opening, people and places and, you know, uh, and you just keep, keep at it, persist with it and the world just opens up to you more and more. Yeah, yeah awesome. I mean, that's really awesome that you're saying that here because, as you know, we're here in BPM College and uh, a lot of uh, guys and girls here are uh, actually students and, you know, they study music, they study electronic music and electronic mm -hmm. production, so I think it's pretty important that they could actually hear it for you know, from someone who actually lives the dream. Yeah, yeah. Okay, <coughs> thanks for that one. So, what was actually the most significant and, uh, you could say, unique performance or uh, event you have uh, attended to so far <laughs> that you can recall? Yeah, it's, uh, 
hard, hard to pick one, but I mean, I, I suppose what comes to mind, first of all, is uh, Boom Festival in 2012. Oh. I don't know, was anybody there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it was just a beautiful, uh, you know, show. Uh, you know, obviously, a lot of people, but not, not just a lot of people, but a lot of people I knew as well from all over the world. You know, my wife and my close friends, and then all these people who I'd mm -hmm. met from all around the world, America, Australia, New Zealand, Israel, everywhere, you know, so many friends in the crowd. And, and the, the set was basically perfectly timed so that like, as my last track was playing, the sun came over like behind me and like illuminated the dance floor and the full moon was in the distance. So I was like looking at the moon going down as the, as the set was playing, the sun was coming up like right behind it. And then on the last tune, like they both just, they were both there and the energy of the sun and the moon was like right incident in the dance floor. It was just, it was a really magical, like kind of emotional that's, moment. Just, that's, that's creepy, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's creepy. Yeah, it was like one of those sort of pinch me, you know, on my dreaming sort of gigs, you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, that felt just like a huge uh, dream. And I, you know, cause I, I went to Boom in 2008 and um, uh, you know, at that point I'd only released one record. And I was like, I'm going to play here in 2012. You know, I, I didn't, I didn't believe I could make it by 2010, but I was like, four years. I'm like, I can do this, you know. And uh, yeah, so it was a real sense oh. of achievement. And uh, so it's yeah. like all about setting the goals and then achieving them, and then like you know, having fun looking at the moon and the sun. And uh, yeah, just yeah. being that that moment of yeah, just cosmic sort of uh, yeah. yeah interaction. It was yeah, really yeah stuff cool. like that happens at the boom all the time. I mean, it's it's yeah. a pretty pretty <laughs> place in general. Okay, and uh, what are your uh, aspirations for the future? I mean, uh, what's being planned ahead? And if you could give us a little mm -hmm. something to anticipate. Yeah, well, um, you know, I've been on a big journey. I mean, I left Scotland when I was 21 to go to university, and then I kind of just been on this journey for like the last 20 years. Um, I lived in America and Hawaii for three years, and I uh, just got back last summer to Scotland, you know, after nearly 20 years away. And uh, so I've been putting down some roots there and I've built myself a studio, like a, like a little log cabin studio separate from our house. And uh, I'm basically settling in for the long term because I've been moving around a lot and it's actually quite a hindrance to making music. You know, on the one hand, musicians have to move, they have to travel. On the other hand, the more you do it, you know, the less time you have to really get that solitude and space that you need to do your best work, you know. So finding that balance has been tricky, particularly having children and stuff as well, you know. But now that I'm back in Scotland, I've got my family around me and I'm settled, I don't have to move. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm getting really deep into some new music, the next generation awesome. of my sound. Um, I'm going to share with you today something I've been working on for the last few weeks. Um, but yeah, really, it's just for me, I. I I have to keep doing different things now. You know, I, I did the same thing for a lot of years, you know, the same kind of music, the side breaks, same sort of tempo, same sort of beats. And, I, you know, those were great years, but it got to a point where I realized that like, like limiting myself to like one single style was like the biggest thing holding, holding me back. You know, it was completely arbitrary. You know, why am I making all this music at just one tempo when there's all these other tempos that can sound great as well, you know? And, and so now, uh, really in my creative process, I have to, I have to be doing something new. I have to get like new new tempos or new beat structures or you know something that I haven't done before to kind of inspire inspire me. So we're gonna hear a little bit uh, more diverse uh, type of uh, head flux in the yeah yeah. Years. I mean, I don't really put, want to put any limits on it except to say that I'm probably not gonna just make music like my old music again because I already oh, yeah. did that. You know, I know a lot of people kind of want you to. It's you become known for something, you know, and then yeah, it's kind of it. hard to. Kind of break out of that, but you know, um, it was kind of necessary. You know, I just needed to really explore explore music more broadly. So, you know, I'm just going to continue on that path. And um, really, what I, I want to do now that I haven't done before is, rather than making albums, I would like to kind of release music more regularly. So, putting out like two or three tracks at a time, um, and maybe getting videos done and stuff like that as well. So, the last sort of four or five years, I've been working on albums, but. You know, the issue with that is there's a lot of time, a lot of investment, a lot of money, and you know, uh, and you're obviously like holding on to music for a long time and then just dumping it all on people at once. But uh, yeah, so I've, I've kind of got that, got that album th thing out of my system now, and uh, I just want to get back to make, making more regular releases of music um, for, for people, yeah. So that's kind of what I'm planning for the awesome, future. Awesome, um, awesome, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, good luck with that, for yeah. sure. So, uh, could you tell us a little bit about uh, audio alchemy? And, sure. Well, uh, I'm what's it all about? And you know, yeah. Well, I'm going to talk about that today. I'm, I'm so my my workshops in two parts. I'm going to give a presentation about uh, alchemy and how it applies to 
music production. Um, and uh, then I'm going to open Ableton, and I've got a project that, uh, as I say, I've been working on the last few weeks. So I'm just going to talk through the different sound design, the thinking behind it, the composition, and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. Yeah, but in general terms, what's the idea in, in general, behind yeah, the, so the, <coughs> the Alchemy uh, project? So it came about really what's as, going on there? as a result of, you know, I'd studied physics, I uh, studied music. And through my path in music, I, um, you know, became into like spiritual, you know, spiritual mm -hmm. science, and uh, you know, through you know, experience, various experiences of, of 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 a spiritual nature, which didn't really happen to me until I pursued music. Um, and so I, I wanted to bring this all together into like a common sort of framework because I recognize that like when you make music, you're undergoing a trans a transformation. So like you have, you know, some condition, you know, you're, you're in your room, you have sort of some feeling or some experiences that you've been digesting, and then you have to then transform that into, you know, this product, this musical product, which is like a, a sort of distillation of, of all that you're, you've been going through. Um, and, and so you actually go through a trans transformation when you make the music, but then when you release the music, there's an, another level of the transformation because the culture around you starts to tr transform. So like people start coming into your life that you know, you, you've never met before, and as I say, opening doors for you that, you know, you didn't even know were there. Um, and so I, I, I saw that it being a hugely transformative force in my life. And so I came across alchemy, which is really the science of transformation. It's the science of how things change from one state to another, and how you can take something rough and heavy and transmute it into something beautiful and pure and, you know, uh, kind of functional and... Uh, so it's all about, yeah, tr like the lead into gold thing is like really a, a, a metaphor for taking something like kind of heavy and undesirable and like transmuting it through work and art and ingenuity into something which is, you know, pure and, uh, um, yeah, like yeah. medicine, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so so basically what I did was I studied alchemy in great depth and it's very, very deep and, you know, I can only just scratch the surface here, but I, I made the correspondences between alchemy and modern music production. Um, so that's what I'll, I'll talk about today. Awesome, yeah. awesome. I think uh, many here, many people here can relate to that, you know, the spiritual side of, uh -huh. of actually dealing with music and dealing with art. Uh, well, it actually leads me to the last question for today. And it's actually something that uh, I personally <laughs> wanted to ask because I'm really... Um, you know, it makes me really, really curious. What is actually the link between PhD in uh, in quantum physics and bass music, or <laughs> and down tempo music, or <laughs> well, <laughs> music in general? Well, the 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 link is really that um, all is vibration. Oh, um, and so uh, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh, quantum physics oh, well. is uh, all wave equations. So you, you know you're using sine waves and uh, the, you know adding them together just like you do on synthesizers but you're doing it um, to describe atoms and waves and uh, light and things like that so I mean like atoms <coughs> the equations which describe atoms are actually called spherical harmonics you know it's because they're they work just like chords like musical chords but they're spherical instead of you know we usually look at it two-dimensionally yeah. um, so yeah quantum physics describes the behavior of atoms and particles and it describes them in terms of a harmonic science um, and uh, you know things that exist exist because they're harmonic you know and things that fall apart fall apart because they're not harmonic you know so it's it's a music what, what the alchemy really taught me is that the universe is musical in in nature you know it like it has to be you know I mean our hearts have beats you know we have our breath you know like everything is happening to rhythm to beats and music is really when we we kind of arrange it so that you know it, it tells a story and everything like lines up and uh, it's a kind of medicine, you know. I mean, it yeah. it really uh, heals you. You know, the, the alchemists revered music as being a kind of protection from dark thoughts and you know negative spirals. You know, music was seen as this kind of like protective force that would like keep you, you know, in the right frame of mind to be doing your work. You know, so. Um, it's, uh, well, depending yeah. on the music. Yeah, depending <laughs> on the music. Yes, of course. Yeah, it's it's not all. Yeah, it's not all love and light. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's all about harmony eventually. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. thank you for that. And uh, we were talking about harmony, so I will harmonically go to, the, <laughs> to sit on the back and uh, yeah, let well, you take it from here. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> okay. 
OK, so um, I'm going to come back to this, this glyph that you see here, uh, which is something we made to kind of uh, c condense all this audio alchemy knowledge into like one single uh, image, uh, which you can use to, you know, for inspiration. But I'll, come, I'll, 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 I'll explain some other things first, and then I'll come back to it. So OK, quick biography. Born in Scotland. I started DJing around 1990 and learning computer music. Um, and then from 96 to 2000, I, I studied theoretical physics at St. Andrews University, and then quantum physics uh, at Surrey University in England. Um, and it was during that time that uh, I started Headflux, although at that time it was just kind of like a, an internet forum name or something, you know? And then it sort of morphed into my DJ name, and uh, yeah, and I was DJing for quite a few years, and the name Headflux, but not producing. Um, and then I started a job after my PhD. I started a job as an IT consultant. You know, I'd kind of I'd had enough of physics at that point, and it's you know very very specialist stuff. I mean, theoretical physics, a lot of it's, you know, doesn't really apply to reality. You know, so you think <laughs> when you, you get a job, you're very smart, but you know what you know doesn't really apply to anything useful. So it, it's that kind of a situation. But anyway, I'd had enough, and I wanted to go out in the world and make some money because I've been in education my whole life pretty much. I was like 25, you know. So I got a job. Didn't like that either, um, but I uh, was making you know more and more music, and I released my first record in 2008, uh, which was M "Music Is My Weapon." And then uh, I did another th three or four tracks, I think, over the next two years. It was quite slow at that point; still took a long time to write music. Um, and then in 2010, I quit my job to go full time with music. Um, <laughs> then, so I toured basically Europe and Australia and. Uh, you know, Russia and came out to Israel and, you know, got around um, during those five years. But then I got a three-year visa for the USA in 2015. Uh, I left the UK for Central America. I spent six months in Central America learning about shamanism and going through the whole ayahuasca um, uh, sort of healing ceremonies and all this kind of thing. And then I went to Hawaii, uh, where I stayed for two and a half years. Uh, during that time, I started Audio Alchemy um, and released the album Soul Science. Um, and Audio Alchemy was really, it was a retreat in Hawaii. So H Hawaii is kind of like a, a great place for retreats. You know, it's a very common thing there. Um, you know, it, people come out for a few weeks and just beautiful, lush, you know, Hawaiian uh, nature and, you know, learn, you know, intensively on something. So, so we, we built a whole two-week course uh, on, on Audio Alchemy, and I'm going to condense that for you um, today just to get the, the basics out of it. And then, yeah, last year I returned to Scotland uh, after leaving in yeah, 2000 and uh, released the Kin album, which is a collab collaborative album I did with my friend Alex Delfont and uh, some other music. And then, yeah, I've uh, been building my studio and settling into my new life um, since then. I've had a bit of time off. Actually, this is my first gig since uh, yeah, early November. Um, and. Uh, yeah, I've just been working on getting my new home, my new studio, my new sound uh, together. So I'm stoked to be back out on the road and uh, out playing music again. Uh, it's weird taking a break from it. Like, I mean, three months doesn't seem like that long a time, but like, it makes you realize like, how much you need to get out in the world and play music. <laughs> um, cool. OK, so audio alchemy. Um, so the term, uh, let's see, alchemy is known as the great work or the art. Um, and it's an ancient system of knowledge for creativity and transformation on all levels. And so that's just a, a quick summary. And you know, I, I believe is anybody in the creative arts should should know about this and we would receive inspiration from it. It's like a system of knowledge for taking inspiration from everything that's around you. Um, <clears throat> so I'll just talk about the origins of it briefly. So Manley P. Hall says that the alchemy or the secret art of the land of Chem is known as, is one of the two oldest sciences known to the world. The other is astrology. The beginnings of both extend back into the obscurity of prehistoric times. So it's actually quite tricky to find the origins of alchemy. Um, it just goes way, way back. There's a few different definitions of the word. So uh, the Egyptian sort of interpretation is al-Kemet, which Kemet was the ancient name of Egypt, land of the black earth. Uh, so al-Kemet al meaning like from Egypt or of Egypt. And then the other uh, translation is in the Greek, is alchemia, with chemia being the root of the word chemistry, which is to fuse or cast earth. And the al meaning like all 
or L, or it's like the definite article like God or the. So it's, it's, it's in some ways known as all chemistry or God's chemistry. So the idea being that regular chemistry that you learn in school only works with matter. Okay, it works with salts and minerals and materials. Um, but alchemy, alchemy works with matter, soul, and spirit, which is all three levels. Okay, so just chemistry, just, just the material level. <coughs> okay. So I'll talk about the elements and how they relate to music. So you, you, you've heard of these before, uh, fire, earth, air, and water. Um, now they're written by these symbols of the triangles. So the idea is that the air and fire are the masculine uh, elements, and they're written by an upward-facing triangle because they go up, so like heat goes up, air is up. And water and earth are the downward triangle because water flows down and earth is down like beneath our feet. Um, and they correspond with the humors, so you have like air and water, like it's moist, and air and fire is warm, fire and earth is dry, earth and, earth and water is cold. Um, and uh, yeah, this is just kind of the basic idea of the elements. And it's, it's kind of, nowadays they don't think this way in science, but it's not because it's been superseded or, you know, it's not out of date. It's, it's actually very fundamental, and it's just been kind of misunderstood and occulted and swept away, but as you'll see, it's, it's really powerful stuff. So, <clears throat> The elements, they don't correspond to literal water. You know, when they say water, it doesn't mean H2O. It means the state of liquid. Okay, so in alchemy, when you say water, it's not just talking about H2O, but it'd be talking about mercury as well. Okay, mercury is often called the water that doesn't wet the hands. Yeah. Um, and so it's an archetype. These elements are like archetype, archetypal forms, not the specific things that we, we think they are. So uh, they correspond with the states of matter. So we have earth, which corresponds with solidity, you know. Um, water, which corresponds with liquid. Air, which corresponds with gas. Um, fire, which corresponds with light. And then ether, which is the fifth element, which corresponds with space. You can see the symbol for ether. I'm sure you're all familiar with that symbol. <laughs> well, yeah, it just comes from adding all the elements, all the elemental symbols together. Um, so it's just showing that all, ether is the space in which everything exists, and then the elements are then of the ether. <clears throat> okay, so because we ourselves are made from elements, we have different levels of our body which correspond um, with these elements. So with the element of earth, we have the body, the physical body, like the bones and the muscles and the, you know, the, the, the solid matter of our body. Uh, the water corresponds with liquids and our emotions, okay? So things like the blood and the tears and cerebral spinal fluid and oils, the different oils in the body, all liquid, all to do with emotions. And then the air, this gas, corresponds with our thoughts, or like a speaking, okay? We speak in, into the air. Uh, air is the medium of thought, okay? So the, the air is the medium through which thought in, is communicated, is sound. Um, <clears throat> and then fire. Um, is not exactly flames, you know, we tend to think of it as flames, but as I got deeper into this, I realized like fire, like a flame is not actually an element, it's light, you are talking about light, okay, so when you say fire, we're talking about like the light coming from the sun, the light coming from the stars, the light coming from the moon, all the fire is above, yeah, it's in the sky, the earth doesn't glow itself, you know, it's like it's everything in the sky that is where the light comes from. Uh, and this corresponds with our soul, okay, so the soul is associated with our inner fire, um, and, uh, you know, our kind of inner flame. And then the ether, which uh, is associated with spirit. So ether being kind of this everlasting thing, and spirit the same as being an everlasting. Soul is something that's created. You know, thoughts, emotions, and body are all temporary things. Um, so I like this picture from Alex Gray, which sort of shows all these different levels, like, really nicely. He has a way of just seeing right through things. Um, so obviously you see there the bones and the, the muscles and stuff which correspond with the earth. And then there's veins carrying all the liquids and stuff around the body um, for the emotions. Uh, we see this fire in the center of the heart space and in the center of the mind is like this, this sort of soul fire. And then all these symbols uh, around the outside, those are basically prayers um, or thoughts uh, written in various different languages. So I think there's like a whole bunch of different, uh, different prayers written in there. And then the ether is this kind of electrical uh, space substance that you see around at the back, <coughs> the back of his head. So how does this relate to music then? Well, we can add another uh, level in this. So 
with earth and the body, it corresponds with rhythm, okay? As I was talking about, the, this, this goes in order of increasing frequency, increasing subtlety, okay? So in a, in a musical composition, the rhythm and the drums are the lowest frequency aspect that like, hold it all together. And as we go up in frequency, we get the bass, which corresponds with emotions and water. <coughs> now, you'll see, you see like, a good way to, to hear how bass corresponds with emotions is if you if you were to sample like uh, some people having a bit of an argument or just having like a heated conversation, and you like cut out all the high frequencies, you can't work out anything that's being said. You can still hear the emotion of the conversation from just the bass frequencies, even though you don't hear any of the information being discussed. You know, like it's like if someone's having an argument in the, in this, <laughs> the house above you, you know, you can't hear their words, but you know the emotions, you know, because the emotion is carried by the bass and the communication, the thoughts. Is carried by the melody of your voice. Yeah, that's like the air. So, melody is based on the way we talk and the way we express thoughts. And then, on the soul level, <clears throat> we're talking about dynamics. Okay, so the dynamics is how the 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 music is uh, how it breathes. Really, you know how it goes between loud and quiet. It's like that. That's kind of the the soul of the music. You know, and then people even say like when things. When music gets squashed and has no dynamics, you know, it's, uh, there's no soul, you know, but you take something like the James Brown funky drummer beat, it's like full, full of dynamics and it's, you know, it's like it's really soulful, you know, just clip of music, like six seconds long or something, but it's just full of soul because it's just got that dynamic of the drummer. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, and then on the, on the level of ether and space and spirit, we have inspiration, okay, that's where we get, you know, the, the spirit is in the word inspiration, in spirit, you know. Um, so that just kind of comes in as more mysterious, you know, it kind of gets more mysterious as you go up. Okay, so that's the elements. <coughs> so there's also the three principles, um, and this is in alchemy called salt, sulf sulfur, and mercury. Now, again, we think of salt, we think of the salt we put on our, on our hummus or whatever. Um, <laughs> But uh, again, this is, we're talking about archetypal salt, and what, what that really, salt really means is structure, because structure, uh, salts are geometrically structured uh, atoms, um, and so when we talk about salt in the archetypal sense, we're talking about structure uh, and geometry. And then sulfur is about energy, okay? Sulfur's got this inner heat, you know, it's able to like burn things, and uh, you know, it kind of carries that kind of, that soul fire. And then mercury, <clears throat> Mercury is to do with information, communication, um, or like interest. Uh, you know, I like to say it's like in, you know interest. You know, like mer Mercury is the kind of the uh, corresponds with like the god of uh, you know the creator of um, you know magic and like math and you know Mercury is uh, classically um, attributed to developing like language and hieroglyphs and you know. Um, all these things that we take for granted, you know, math, number, music, medicine, all these things, you know, a lot of it all goes back to Mercury, this, this archetype of Mercury, or Thoth, um, or Hermes Trismegistus, you may have heard, They're all kind of the same, same sort of thing. It's this kind of intellectual energy that's within, you know, within us. And so, <clears throat> if we look at this, it'll show you, <coughs> so the prima materia is essentially consciousness, it's the basis of uh, all of reality. And it's shown here by the, you know, the yin yang, because it, which in the middle has a sine wave. Yeah, if you really notice, has a sine wave right down the middle. Um, and one side is black, one side is white, but there's a bit of white in the dark and a bit of dark in in the light. Okay, so <coughs> that's showing you just the essence of the prime material is this vibrational substance. <coughs> Excuse me. So. From the prime substance, then, they define these two uh, types, like fixed and volatile. Uh, and these are associated with gender, like masculine and feminine. And uh, so we have the two, the two feminine elements, earth and water, coming out, uh, and they're more fixed. And the volatile elements, air and fire. And then from like earth and water, you get salt. And like from water and air, you get mercury. And from air and fire, you get sulfur. Um, and so I, I just kind of overlaid that with some musical terms to kind of bring it together. So <clears throat> you see like the rhythm and bass are the more fixed elements in the music, yeah? And together they form the structure, yeah, like salt. And then the bass and the melody is the interest, okay? Because that's where they're like the different notes are, the, you know, where you're expressing all the different musical notes and chords and stuff is in the bass and melody. That gives you that mercurial aspect. 
And then the melody and dynamics together is like the energy. Okay, so it's like the you know how how the melody is moving, you know how it's expressed, how it how it becomes exciting or dies down or up and down. You know those those kind of dynamic movements uh, uh, is like the energetic quality of the music. <coughs> so there's uh, seven operations which uh, are. So the number seven comes up again and again and again, and it all relates to the, the seven luminaries, you know, the Sun, the Moon, Mars, Mercury, Venus, uh, Jupiter, and Saturn. And uh, it all comes to them because they're the, the luminous wandering bodies. So they notice that like, all the stars move in like, fixed patterns. That's why they're called the fixed stars. But these seven luminous lights would, had these wandering paths. And so <clears throat> they were attributed to uh, producing the change that we experience. Because if all the stars were just going around in fixed circles, we'd probably just exist in a loop. It's the fact that we've got these planets that are actually moving in ways where they never find this, the same configuration twice. They're always moving. So, and so each of the seven planets were associated with certain vibrations, certain types of consciousness, and this is where the seven uh, operations come from. So <coughs> I'll talk about them in alchemy, then I'll talk about them in music, and then I'll come back to the glyph that I had at the start and <coughs> bring it all together. So, step one, calcination, which is about heating and roasting um, in alchemy, but it's really about like reducing something to its purest essence. So, you know, like t taking something and like kind of like burning it or heating it and reducing it to ashes. Uh, it's kind of like a purification by fire. <coughs> um, and then the next, the next step, they would then take these, these ashes and then dissolve it in water. So the second stage is called dissolution. And that allow it all to mix, and it's kind of a, it's associated with water. So the first the first one with fire, then water, and so you, you, you kind of mix it up. I mean, you could think of this like making kombucha or something. <laughs> like uh, you do all these kind of steps, you know, um, or like cooking. Uh, you know, this is another type of alchemy. Your kitchen's basically an alchemy lab for food, you know. Um, and a separation, which is then sort of sifting. So like once it's all dissolved, it's then like separating what you don't want from what you do want, you know. And uh, it's like a sifting or a filtration process. And then once you've got all the bits that you do want and you separate all the bits you don't want, then bringing together all the desired bits is the conjunction. Okay, that's a co combining and unifying things into a new thing. Um, and then fermentation comes after the conjunction. So this is kind of death and rebirth um, process. Uh, you can, again, think of kombucha. So you've got your tea and, and, and sugar in there and then you put this uh, SCOBY in, this kind of bacterial entity which then eats the tea and sugar, basically killing it, but then infuses it with all these probiotic goodness and makes this delicious, you know, fermented drink, which is, you know, medicine. You know, the tea and the sugar by itself is not, you know, doesn't have a high medicinal quality, but once it's undergone a fermentation process, it's, you know, really medicinal. Um, and that's because it's infused with new life. And then distillation <coughs> is uh, this process of Gradually heating a liquid, as it sort of rises up through these like chambers, and then it condenses on the top, and then cools down, and then it's collected. And you can run this distillation process for ages, and it just like purifies and purifies until things get more and more refined. And this is kind of a, like an exaltation. You know, you're taking something and making it as pure as it can possibly be. And then coagulation is then the the solidification, the realization of the of the process. You know, it's like the final step. It's like actually getting what you set out to get. So, yeah, you can sort of see this with, like, I say kombucha or, like, wine or, or anything like that. Like, wine, you know, would be fermented from uh, grape juice, but then be distilled to make brandy or something like that, you know. <coughs> okay, so in alchemy, the calcination, we call it calibration uh, or preparation. So this is really the first step in the music-making process is you have to calibrate your instruments. So, you, you know, what are you, what are you making music with, you know? Um, yeah, you're going to need some bass, you know, you're going to need some drums, you're going you're to need all these things that you can play. Um, and uh, yeah, they're going to have to, you know, be designed uh, from the ground up, and that's really calibration. So once you have your instruments calibrated, you can then play, okay? So you can flow. So the dissolution is associated with flowing and jamming, and really just getting out of the way. So that, like, the, the first step is very, like, sort of ego mind, okay, you got to hold back. It's associated with Saturn, like limitation, like ho holding back from actually just getting on with the music and doing the work to make things set up so that, you know, to maximize your potential for music. Because uh, if you try 
jamming with an out of tune guitar or you know um, some crappy like like a saw wave with no you know just a, a saw wave preset like this just sounds terrible. You have to like design the instrument so that it responds to the keys and and so that it becomes a musical instrument. Uh, and then you can flow. Then you can just play and you can get your mind out of the way and you don't even have to think about what you're doing because it just sounds good because you calibrated it well, you prepared well. So, <coughs> yeah, once, you, once you've, you've done some jamming and some playing, you then have a bunch of content, all right? You've got some drum beats, you've got some bass lines, you've got some other things. Um, and then you really need to separate at that point. So it's a filtration. You're like, okay, I'm going to select what's good, you know, what is the gold and what is the dross and, that I'm going to leave behind. And when you have all the good bits together, the conjunction is then the composition of the music, okay? So you're then bringing together all the saved good stuff from the separation, and then you're bringing it together into an arrangement. And this is where, <coughs> you know, this is where it becomes kind of bounded in time, you know, because like up, up to this point, essentially just loops, right? And like, you know, it's just, you know, just loops that are playing, you know, indefinitely. But when you actually get to the conjunction, you have a beginning, a middle, and end, and a definite length of what the track is going to be. Um, <clears throat> then we enter into the fermentation stage, which is about edit, editing and refinement. Okay, so you've got something that's good, but you haven't done any editing at this point. You know, and editing is another whole art form in itself, and it's very much related to fermentation because <clears throat> you're essentially picking it apart. You know, tearing it, tearing the sounds apart, and you know, tweaking them and just making them like smoother and, and finer and more tricky and more interesting. You know, putting a lot of that, a lot of that mercurial stuff, the interest, you know, um, comes at the fermentation stage, you know, where you're really getting deep in, uh, into the sound design and, uh, you know, just get, getting your tune like all tricked out and just with, with, with a new life in it. And so then once you finish the fermentation then you've got your track, it's all, it's, it's arranged, it's composed, it's uh, all got lots of cool edits in it. Um, then it's the distillation, which is this kind of mixed, mixed down process. And again, the correspondence is there, you know, when you're mixing down, I mean, you're literally taking volumes and turning them up and down and trying to find that sweet spot where all the sounds relate and, and cutting things out and distillation works just like that. It's, it's called agitation and sublimation, you know, it, it agitates the substances and they rise up and then they, they come back down again. It's just like, you just do it and it's, yeah, it works just like the mix down process and it's kind of like a polishing, refinement and purifying of the, of the song. And then <coughs> the final step is the coagulation, which really at this, you know, this stage is just mastering, you know, rendering out the track and, and mastering it so that it's, uh, you know, it's up to the right levels and the right dynamics of a modern, um, modern tune, you know. And so, yeah, so we see there's this, this you know, this correspondence here. Um, and uh, as I say, it goes, it goes deep, you know. Um, when you, if you go and research these seven, seven steps, um, you'll find that like, each one is deeply associated with a particular state of mind. Um, and so you can really get into it by, you know, getting yourself in that state of mind. So like with the calibration you know, associated with Saturn, as I was saying, like Saturn is like, <laughs> All about limitation and law and uh, rules and grids and stuff. So, like th this would be like choosing the grid, you know, choosing your tempo, you know, it's, uh, you know, the, the skeleton of the track. Saturn is associated with bones, with, ske with the skeleton, yeah, because the skeleton is the is like the grid upon which the rest of the body hangs. Um, and in, in a musical sense, it's like yeah, it's the grid, you know, it's um, the timing, the tempo, the swing, the tuning you're using, the um, you know, all the kind of rules that you have to play within, you know, that's this kind of Saturn mindset is like the, you know, the, the, the rules. Um, <clears throat> um, and, you know, and, and so on, you know, each one of them has a, has a different sort of uh, mindset which uh, you can use. So <coughs> anyway, so I've got the seven steps around the outside uh, with the corresponding planetary symbol. And then on the inside here, <coughs> we've got uh, like rhythm and bass melody and dynamics, the four elements with the four symbols. And then we put inspiration and medicine on the other side, so inspiration being kind of the fifth element. And medicine, because it's a big part of alchemy, and you know, let's be honest, it's a big part of music culture as well, right? It's like, I mean, we call them drugs, but you know, drug is just um, a bad word for medicine. <laughs> it really is, I mean, it just doesn't, um, it doesn't really mean anything, you know? It means dried, 
uh, in the etym etymologically it means dried. So it was a word that was used to describe dried things like powders, you know, or spices or whatever. But it's, it's not right to call medicine drugs, you know, although it's very common. But um, the word medicine has a completely different meaning from the word drug, although they're used interchangeably. In the UK, it's pretty much drug is just like a kind of grubby media word for medicines that they don't approve of. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, medicine's a big part of alchemy, you know, the elixir of life, you know, it was about finding a universal medicine. Um, and, uh, and of course, you know, medicine is, a, I'm sure, a big part of all our own spiritual journeys as well. So, yeah, tried to bring it all together there, and it's kind of like a recipe for letting music be your medicine. You know, there's kind of two sides to that, you know, on, on the one hand, there's, as an artist, you, you want to be making music has to be your medicine, you know, it's like that, that's why you're doing it, right? It's like because life is unsatisfactory unless you're making music, so, and it becomes more satisfactory the more music you make. When you finish music, you, you get the sense of satisfaction and growth of like, you know, getting to the next level, you know, unlocking different parts of life. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, yeah, it's, uh, and your life should be getting better, you know, it should be uh, waking you up, you know, and, and making you smarter and, you know, just getting better at your craft. Um, and therefore, it's a, it's a kind of medicine. And then on, on the other side of it, of course, you've got the listener of the music who, you know, they want music that's medicine. You know, they w want to be able to, like, put something on if you're having a bad day and then have that thing, like, just, like, lift you and, like, sort you out and then set you right. Um, <clears throat> so that was it, you know, it was really... Music has been hugely healing, uh, magical, transformative, medicinal uh, force in my life, and uh, I wanted to kind of like bring it all together into you know a system of yeah workflow, um, a way of thinking about music uh, that um, yeah that can just inspire people and uh, help help you in your process. So um, yeah, I think that's the that's the end of my uh, audio alchemy talk. Yeah, it's there. Um, thanks. I know it's a little bit flexible for time uh, afterwards as well. If there's any other questions, anything more specific, I've, I've literally got like hundreds of slides. If so, if, if anyone wants to ask about anything specific, like to do with frequencies and tuning and all that, I can go into that. But I, I, I didn't do it today because it does take a bit of time. Um, <clears throat> okay. <coughs> so, how does it all play out in practice? Well, well, well. Um, <clears throat> you know, actually going through the seven steps <coughs> for you, it just, it just takes a lot of time, and it's not really practical in the time that we have. So as I said, I decided to just go with a, a project that I've been working on and uh, kind of talk through it. <coughs> so I'll talk through a bunch of it before I actually play it, so um, uh, the thinking behind it. So you can see here I've... <coughs> I've divided the groups into, you know, uh, it's like drums, bass, percussion, effects, uh, melodies, and chords. <coughs> and so I usually, I find it's just a really useful way to like break down music. I mean, there's lots of different ways you, ca you can break down music, but uh, you know, everything that I listen to, all the music I like, I mean, uh, every, every single sound that I hear can fit into one of those categories. So. Um, I kind of run with that. And as I said, it's based on the frequency as well. So like with drums being the lowest frequency element and then the bass being above that and then percussion and uh, chords and melodies and then dynamic effects and so on. <coughs> so let me just go through some of the sound design uh, here then. Uh, I know you're all keen for like tips and tricks and stuff. Um, <coughs> uh, let me make sure this is working. <clears throat> okay, so that's just a kick drum, uh, which I made using Operator. Is uh, anyone interested in how I made a kick drum with Operator? Do you want me to show that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so, let me just uh, insert a new one here. So, <laughs> I, I, I work in 432 tuning, which is... Uh, Pretty cool because all the frequencies have like nice, easy to remember whole number values, and so I'm working in the key of uh, E 
for this track. Um, and uh, <coughs> e, the, the, in the 432, the, the frequency of E is 40 hertz. Okay, so all the harmonics are multiples of 40. Um, <coughs> so the first thing I did was um, I created a, just a, a sine wave at 40 hertz, which is going to be like the, the body, like the, uh, sorry, the tail of the kick drum. Okay, so you see it's got a bit of an attack there, like 20 milliseconds attack, because this is going to come like after like the click in the body of the kick drum. It's kind of um, and it's tuned to the key of E. Um, so yeah, nothing too fancy there. And then <clears throat> I've then got a second oscillator here, which is in parallel. Um, and for this, I create the body of the kick. So I went up an octave to 80 hertz. Um, this is using the fixed frequency, by the way, fixed frequency mode, this little button here. And you can just type in the actual number of the frequency that you want, rather than it being uh, mapped to the keys. Um, OK, so this is the body of the kick. So, so you can hear that. That's, uh, it's got a, a shorter attack there, like th three milliseconds and, and a bit of a, a decay. And it's got a bit of a pitch envelope here as well. So you can see pitch envelope up there on oscillator B. And uh, I can actually, I mean, if I wanted, I could sort of brighten it up a bit. I'll change the shape, shape of that to kind of like give the body a bit more mid-range or, or, or whatever. So, and then last but not least, on this oscillator here, um, I've got a, a looped noise, which is basically just like a, a sample of white noise, which is like looping over and over again. Um, and this is to be the attack, okay, the click that hits at the very beginning of the kick drum, the first thing you hear. So there's a zero millisecond attack there, and it's very, very short. So you hear that? That's all it is. Um, so when I combine that with the body and the tail, um, you know, it all kind of sits together. So yeah, I, I'd recommend, I mean, in the past when, I, I've used sample drums for, for a lot of years, and whenever I tried to make kick drums in the past, I, the mistake I was making was trying to do it all with a single oscillator. <laughs> if, you, if you try and make a kick drum with a single oscillator, it just n never comes out quite, yeah, quite strong enough. But if you use three oscillators, you separate it into three, you've got your attack, you've got your body, and then you've got your tail. And you just kind of like line them up, you know, and it's just like, yeah, you can get a really, really good, strong, sound that way. Um, so I mean, these oscillators are all going into a filter here, which uh, I've chosen one of these, these uh, new filter types, which have uh, a filter drive. So you can like kind of drive it and m make the wave a bit more saturated. And then I've got it just driven through this drum bus here as well, which just kind of adds some extra saturation and a bit of a boom. So you see, I've, I've got 40 hertz there. And uh, I can sort of increase that boom like Um, or the, the decay of it. You know, so I've got complete control over like how long and uh, you know how how much attack and stuff. And I can I can dial in these volumes as well if I want to like change the shape of the kick drum. So it's giving me a lot of control. I've got a bit of a multiband compressor here. I'm not sure it's doing too much. Maybe just brightening things up a bit. Yeah, just kind of like bringing the bringing the, the, the mids out a bit, a bit. That's something I often do with kick drums, is kind of like scoop out a bit of the mid-range, you know, because you want to hear that click, and you want to hear the thump. But uh, in that middle, middle range, and that's sort of like 100, 200, 300 hertz, so those can be quite kind of muddy frequencies. They sound a bit like someone knocking, you know, on a door. So like, sometimes like scooping those out, and it gives room for, you know, your bass lines and your melodies in that, in that frequency range as well. Um, <clears throat> cool. So. I also made uh, snare with operator as well, using a very similar approach. Um, and uh, um, <clears throat> same sort of idea. So for the snare, I wanted to make it harmonic with the kick drum. So I used 160 hertz, which is the fourth harmonic in the key of E. Um, and uh, again, I've got a sine wave there. <clears throat> And it's just very short, it's a short attack, short decay. That's all it is, it's just a, a donk. <clears throat> um, and then down here, I've got the, the loop noise again. 
very short, just gives it that initial attack. Um, <clears throat> and then in here, uh, I've got the white noise, which, which is kind of the tail of it. It's kind of turned down a bit at the moment. I could probably get a bit more volume out of that. Um, and then within the white noise here, I, you know, I see I've got control here over the decay and release, so I can sort of make the snare like bigger, you know, if I want to, um, or automate that over time, you know, so you can start it out kind of quite tight and then have the, the snare kind of getting bigger as, as the track's getting more exciting. Um, and yeah, again, I just run that through a filter here, choose one of these filter types, and then this is pretty heavily driven, like 22 dB of drive there. A little bit of EQ, just smoothing it out. And then I've got this rack that I made, which is basically a whole load of uh, these eight kind of effects, which are all like different combinations of distortions and saturations. Um, so I've kind of run it through this. If I turn that off. Yeah, that's quite a difference, yeah. So I just really give it some body and uh, a bit of distortion. And uh, yeah, I could I'll show you in here. I mean, this like loads of effects like uh, so <coughs> yeah and that can be fun on, on all sorts of things and a little bit of compression there as well so um, all right so that's just the kick in the snare and uh, as I say I usually use samples um, but uh, this time I just wanted to build everything myself from the ground up really um, so yeah uh, for the hi-hat <coughs> I used serum is everyone familiar with serum have you ever used it for hi hats before? <laughs> it's really good. Yeah, it's, it's got a, it's got all these like noise, uh, different noise sa sources in here, and obviously it's got great envelopes and filters and everything. So, it's, uh, it's pretty good for making hi hats. Um, I'm just using like a, just an organ noise there, a bit of a high pass filter. Um, actually, all those effects are turned off. Um, a bit of drive and so on. Um, not that exciting, but uh, <coughs> it's good when it's in there with everything else. Uh, I've got some just ride cymbals there, um, and uh, some filter drums. Okay, so that's just the drum track, yeah, nothing too fancy in there. And then within the bass group, I've got a few different basses. This one is not doing anything. Why not? Uh, anyway, okay, this one. What's going on? Oh, the. Base group has turned right down. Sorry about that. There we go. I must have touched something on the APC. <clears throat> okay, just just a just a nice clean uh, sub sub base there. Um, just yeah, nothing too nothing too fancy there. Just a bit a bit of a saw wave mixed in with a sine wave with a heavy low cut. Um, and yeah, not even any effects. So that's just a nice simple uh, sub there. <clears throat> And then for my more uh, expressive bass, so with the subs, you know, it's kind of like holding down that low end. That's like your earth, like your lowest frequency, your fundamental. But then I usually create another bass patch, which will be used for like bass effects, you know, so for like modulation and, you know, squelchy noises and all that kind of thing. Um, and so for that, I've used a <coughs> Razor, um, which just has a great sound to it. Uh, not at the moment, but uh, actually, yeah. Gotta get this. Go down an octave or two here. Uh, where's the octave control? Yeah. So the power of this is 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 really in having the different parameters all moving together, which is not something you can do with your hands, but uh, <coughs> something which you have to do in automation. So you see, if I open up this channel here. I've got a lot of automation going on, like I've got two different filter types, so a comb filter and a low pass filter, and I'm moving them both, like each of them have got like four or five parameters, and you know, moving them both at the same time this, uh, using different can shapes. Solo? Sorry? Can you play it? Sure, yeah, yeah. Wait, wait a minute. I'm holding back the track for later, yeah. <laughs> Just give you a little, little tease. Uh, some other bits down here as well. Audio bit. Is someone the cutoff? 
Yeah, so the cutoff, the, the, yeah, so the low pass cutoff is kind of the strongest um, of the parameters there. So like that's the low pass cutoff there. So like, whoop, whoop, whoop. But then down here, this is uh, like the, um, I think the phase of the, of the comb filter. Um, yeah, these are all like fil filter two controls. So um, yeah, down here you've got this comb peak filter. And yeah, I'm just moving like the phase, the stretch, the boost, and you know, often you're just drawing a line or you know a curve, and uh, you know just tweaking it until it until it sounds good. You know, it's a bit more of a kind of trial and error process with that rather than a jamming, you know, jamming the jamming it in because you you need to have like many controls changing at once to get the really interesting sounds. So uh, yeah, so that's that's what I use for these little like bass wobbles and uh, you know various other sounds which I'll. I'll I'll show you when I get there. Um, so I've got some bass parts here. These are just some other little bits that I sampled out from Reactor. Seems like that. Anyway, sounds better when it's in with everything else. Um, uh, hang on. <clears throat> okay, so in the percussion now, um, <clears throat> very simple again, um, just a noise symbol, kind of with uh, some EQ here, so I can kind of, so I can create kind of, um, you know, um, crashes and things like that, some like low down, other ones that are high up. Um, these like little sign pip things, uh, yeah, just uh, that kind of thing, which I, I made using this this instrument here. So <clears throat> this is really cool. Uh, let's see. Oops. Just a way of like generating um, percussion, you know, percussion patterns, basically at, at random. You know, uh, I've got kind of a control over the pitch, okay. Patterns, uh, randomization. So. I'll show you inside this. Um, so with this, uh, ideas use sampler, and um, I just grabbed a, a bunch of uh, percussion samples from a sample pack. So like 125 samples just from the browser, drag them in, um, and then you know about this thing here where you can choose all the samples and then you can distribute the ranges. Okay, so it's distribute the ranges equally over the keys. So you see here each. Each hit has is on a key, right? You can see there. That's the grid. It shows you it hits on all the keys. So each key has a different hit, and then the arpeggiator is basically just playing a pattern. So like a uh, if I turn the random off, you'll just hear it's just playing a, a looping pattern. And it's actually got eight steps, so that's why it's it's, it's going over one. It's going over one there. But bring this back a bit. Okay, it's just playing a pattern, but because there's a different key uh, for the different sample on every key, every key will produce a different, a different pattern, right? Everyone's different. You can change the pattern. You can randomize it and uh, do various other things. So yeah, the arpeggiator is just spitting out MIDI notes and just like selecting these different samples. It affects them the same, the arpeggiator. Um, yeah, so the arpeggiator is just putting out MIDI notes. You know, um, which are triggering the, the keys. I've got a randomizer here, which after the arpeggiator, so that can then randomize the MIDI notes. And then, yeah, within here, um, you know, the samples are just being triggered, but they're also being looped. So they're they're short samples. Uh, hang on. So when I open when I open up the decay, you start to hear them looping. 
as I open it. I turn it. You hear it now, like when the pitch is way up. It's one of the most satisfying and just easy to play instruments. <laughs> but uh, so I always do something like this in every track, you know. Um, I'll, you know, sometimes I'll just pull in this instrument and then I'll delete all the samples in it because I used them in like a previous track and then I'll go and find a bunch of other samples, pull them in, and then, you know, just have a whole new, uh, yeah, a whole new arsenal of like percussion, yeah, uh, loops and things that I can just make easily, you know. Um, so yeah, that's uh, so I use that to make uh, some of these different some of these different bits. Uh, actually, I might have used a synthesizer for this. Actually, that, yeah, that was using that was using serum. Um, so yeah, so it just you see just little bits like percussion, just little short noises like white white noise and stuff like that. Um, and uh, in this uh, effects section here. There's nothing too much. I've just got a few little risers just for that dynamic excitement around drops and things. Uh, something like this. Yeah, which is just uh, quite nice. And uh, just, yeah, just some like white noise risers and things. I was all trying to keep go for simplicity with this, you know. Uh, as I said, I had a bit of a break from making music. I was coming back to it in a new studio with, you know, everything was new, new environment, new home. And I had the mother of all creative blocks. <laughs> and uh, I was just like, how do I even, what even is music anymore, you know? Uh, <laughs> and so I had to really come back to basics with this track. And um, yeah, so let me just talk about the melody then. So it all started with the melody. Um, I, you know, if in doubt, I, I read this from Tipper, actually, an interview with Tipper, and it's quite rare he does any interviews or anything, but um, you know, he said if he, gets, if he gets stuck on what to do, he just always goes back to the, the sine wave. Yeah, because it's just like, just back to the sine wave, just the pure tone. Um, and so that's, uh, that's what I did. I just like, um, got some sine waves in silent. Um, let's get a bit more. Kind of, I think that distortion is the speaker, right? That's not happening on my end, I hope. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so just a, a sine wave um, oscillator here uh, with a few different voices. I turned that voices up, detuned a little bit, so they're kind of like left and right, um, and just with a, a bit of delay, so just kind of simple, pure tone. Um, and then I've got a, a bit of saturation, and then this echo boy effect, which. Uh, Kind of creates this nice kind of that kind of ch -ch 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 delay, um, and uh, I made this uh, melody, which I'll play to you in just a second. Once I've gone through the other tracks, um, got this nice main lead here, um, which uh, I made using Wavetable. Give you a wee blast of this. This is actually quite a potent sound as you see the CPU is way up there. <laughs> anyway, so um, it kind of carries on like that, but I'm gonna, I've recorded that into audio, so I'm gonna turn that off. Uh, for now, and uh, I'll go. Th I'll go through this, and then I'll play it, and then we can come back and focus on uh, some of the other bits. So, um, I've got another. That's the main lead audio there. Yeah. Okay. Let me turn that off. Um, and then, yeah, I just got a lead here, which I haven't actually used, but I've been contemplating recording something with it. But. Uh, Quite nice. I'm gonna play it over the top of, of the music, but um, yeah, that's just made using Serum. 
and uh, it's kind of uh, Okay, so you see how the wave has got some distortions in it, and it's kind of like moving, like uh, you know, in a sort of almost organic way. Like, so I made that wave table myself. You know, you when you take sine waves and mix them with a little bit of noise, you can then resample it back in as a wave table, um, and it's good. You can get these really interesting wave tables which have this kind of like natural kind of like noise, like phase movement going on. Um, and I can talk more a bit about that um, later as well if, if people want to know about it. OK, and then the final group here is uh, chords. And I've not got much in here. I've just got a, a choir, which uh, the Spitfire Labs, um, th yeah, they, they have a whole lot of free instruments, the choir, piano, like they're amazing. Um, Spitfire Labs, uh, you can download it all for free. Um, and uh, so it's a uh, yeah, a bit of a choir going on there, and then I've got this chord swell. Ooh, that's loud, hey? Um, What's the name of it again? Sorry. It's called a chord swell. Um, so I've basically just got a. Um, Chord here, which is just doing like a like one octave down and a, a perfect fifth. Um, so it's kind of equivalent to me playing E, E, and A, uh, A, E, and B at the same time. And actually, this chord changes throughout the track. So you see that that's automated. So it's, it switches between I go for, it's a uh, e, e minor to A, a major uh, chord transition. All right. So I've talked through all the sounds. Uh, I'll, I'll, play, I'll play the track for you now. Okay, and it should be all good to go. All right.
I got there in the end. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, it's a bit different to uh, what I've done before. I mean, one thing I found that, uh, you know, I started out making, trying to make club music, you know, like going to clubs, hearing, like, you know, trance and techno and breaks and stuff, and then trying to reverse engineer that. So I would always start with beats, you know, if I was making music, just to start with the kick drums, the snare drum, and then you're sort of like, making the beat and then kind of decorating the beat with sounds, you know, and, and that was kind of how I, I used to approach it. But now I find I, I get a lot better if I actually just start with a melody, you know. More traditional way of, of writing a song, you know, is actually like having a melody. So I'll tell you about this melody. It's, uh, it's quite nice, it's quite pleasant. Um, and uh, it sort of works on this principle of like three in one. Um, so like having three... Uh, Three repetitions and then the fourth one different, and then three repetitions and then the fourth one different. So uh, you see, this like this is basically a bar and then the same bar and then the same bar again, and then the fourth bar goes up, and then there's then another three bars which are slightly different, and then the fourth bar goes down. <coughs> And see, it's just, it's just kind of complete in itself, you know, and it, it, it plays for the entire duration of the track, you know. I never even really uh, took it out once, and uh, it kind of held the whole track together, and it, it dictates, you know, it dictates, it dictates the bass line, and, uh, you know, it, it, the, always having this, like, fourth bar or the eighth bar, you know, like having seven and one or having three and one, you know, the fourth bar and the eighth bar are, like, your power, that's, like, your... your chance to like transform what you've done you know it's like you can like stretch things out for three bars or seven bars but then that last one is like you're coming to the end of the phrase and it's time to like you know take it you know take it up or take it down um, and uh, so yeah just kind of like building that in to the start you know and having having that that structure um, really just helped you know the whole the whole track to flow um, and uh, it could be nice to hear it actually with uh, you know just hear some of the elements on their own. Uh, so like taking the drums out because you know the drums are loud and and whatnot. And uh, yeah, it could be nice to just hear even the bass at the moment. So like. like. Oh, well. Now this wavetable thing. It's just going up the scale with a delay. And then different on the four. And I'm just opening it, you know. So that's the dynamics, yeah. It's just it's that feeling of just like effervescence, like rising up, you know, just like. Whoosh. Whereas if you take the, the bass on its own, it was, uh, I don't know how it was for you guys, but it was kind of hard for me to hear the bass, but I'm obviously behind the speakers. Um, but uh, yeah, like, like the section here, so. So yeah, uh, so you can hear there's that kind of detail and interest in the bass. Um, so the, the 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 sub is just kind of just hitting on the on the one, boom, boom. 
Um, and then the other bit is like it's kind of like decorating. It's like you know leading up to the snares and the kicks, like like opening up into the kicks or coming down like like a more kind of punchy. Um, and yeah, that's all just as I say, just getting in there and uh, you know moving around the different parameters, just drawing in the shapes and uh, you know seeing what feels good. You know, it's a lot of trial and error, but you get more of an instinct for it, of course, the more that you do it. Um, <clears throat> okay, so with this track as well, I so it's in a triplet. It's in a triplet time signature, yeah. It's in an eighth note triplet. Um, but it didn't start in an eighth note triplet. Um, and so one of my ideas for the future um, is because I basically I would just make a track and then get it mastered and then put it in my DJ set and then play it. And I'll do some, I do some live stuff while I'm DJing. So I like, have my, my tracks for mixing and also have synthesizers and percussion stuff I can play and jam over the top of, of the tracks that I'm DJing. But you know, realizing now that like the most important thing to me as you know as a musician as a as a DJ is that I, I need to keep making new music which I release to people, which I give to people, but I also need music that I've got that no one else has got, right? So it's like how do you how do you find that balance? And so with the projects I'm working on currently, I'm kind of opening them into these like whole musical environments where now I you know when I finish this and mix it down and everything, I'll release that what you just heard. But I've got all this other stuff which I'm going to keep for using in, in live sets, you know, for jamming. So this was all in triplets. But I've got another couple of sections over here which are uh, not in triplets but are in just straight sixteenths. Um, and it's a whole different... Sorry. <laughs> And so I'll create a whole bunch of stuff to jam out with that, you know. <laughs> yeah, so I, I guess I kind of had this brainwave of um, you know don't don't make tracks, make tempos. You know, so like it, you know now that I have this sort of template at 150 BPM, I can I can just kind of like keep going. You know, I'll release part of it as a track, but I've got all this other content that I can bounce out just for for my live sets for me to jam with, uh, and so that you know people they, they'll hear something that's familiar, but it's also completely different. It's in a different time signature or whatever. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of uh, my idea for how I'm gonna sort of structure my projects from now on. Rather than just like finish them, render them, and never look at them again, I'm gonna try and make them into these like templates where I can like you know constantly make variations of that song for for use in in my sets. Uh, so that's kind of the plan there. Have you created um, like a media bay or something of yourself of sounds of presets that you create like? Uh you know, like something that you beginning every every song that you come back for the same origin. What like sounds that I or, or you make like presets every song like new synthesis. Oh yeah, every song. Yeah, every yeah. song something every, yeah, completely build everything different from the ground from zero. up. Yeah, like literally. Yeah, every track I use design the kick drum from scratch, design the snare drum from scratch. Um, as I say, sometimes I'll layer samples together to do it, but other times I'll just do it using synths. But. Um, uh, you know, prior to that, I mean, I, I would, yeah, as I say, I, I might use some samples for, for drums and things, but generally uh, all the synth sounds and bass sounds and all that will be made from scratch, you know. I've used a few, a few presets over the years, you know, sometimes you just get a really good preset on something and it just works. It's like, just use it, it doesn't matter. It's like, you know, if you're only using presets and you're never bothering to learn about synthesis, that's a different story, but, you know, it's like, there's no shame in just using a preset here and there if it, if it works, but, um, Generally, I'll yeah, I'll go right back to basic waveforms and design all the sounds from the ground up, and the, you know how they're sensitive to the mod wheels and you know mapping all out, and yeah, I'll do that every time. Yeah, um, and it just kind of go, you know, doing it again and again. I think you, you just you learn so much from it. I mean, uh, you know, you 
it's, it's in a simple terms, you think like a kick drum is a kick drum is a kick drum, but then you realize it's like, it's no, it's you know, it's this hugely complex thing. You know, like every time you do it, it's like different, you know. Because yeah. there is something on the, you know, on the main, on the first idea that you want to hear it fast. Mm -hmm. You want to hear like what you have in your mind, and not like to be stuck on creating now the perfect sound. So <laughs> yeah. it's like it's not comfort for you that you have like the main thing that you know work mm -hmm. always and come back and then to like create something. Yeah, yeah. Well I think it's just the you know the processes and the techniques are the main thing but it's like rather than just like pulling a sample or, or a preset and using it a second time it would you know there'd always be some creative process you know of transforming it. You know, as I say it's all about tran trans transformation at the end of the day. I mean you've you've got you know, you've got all these plugins, you know uh, I mean, I haven't got that many on here, like, because I've just been, got this new laptop, but, um, yeah, you know, some people have just got hundreds of plugins, and it's all these possibilities, all this grid, all these musical possibilities. It's like, how is, you have to, like, condense all of that down into something, like, real. You have to make some choices. You have to limit yourself, you know? Um, and, uh, yeah, from limitation really comes creativity. When you have infinite options, you can't, you can't do anything, you know? Um, yeah. <laughs> So uh, yeah, so I sort of come back to the same sort of techniques again and again, the same sort of instruments. But yeah, I'll always transform it, you know, for that the project I'm working on. Yeah. yeah. Uh, really, fa really fast question. I, so you choose uh, 150 uh, BPM. Uh huh. In this in this kind of groove, probably I would choose 75 BPM. It, there is any yeah. different? Uh, um, well, yeah, I guess. Um, I, this often happens. I mean, it just became like a kind of halftime groove, you know. Um, and I could have, I could have chosen seventy-five, but I chose, I chose one fifty. I guess I don't know. It's, yeah, I, I prefer like just having that extra space in the in the bar than than having it a really slow click, you know, like having a faster click and then but doing it halftime. I, I, I don't know, but it's it's one and the same really. Um, I mean, I can. So some people are people like interested in like the like frequencies and four thirty two and that kind of thing. Yeah. So I, I I'll show you like okay I'll show you just one one slide then before I do the live set stuff. Okay, so <clears throat> what I've done here is um, map the twelve musical notes to the colors. Um, so the color uh, the visible color spectrum spans one octave. Yeah, everyone know that it's like one octave of light. Whereas we can perceive. Uh, like sort of 10 or 12 octaves of sound, we can only perceive one octave of light, and it goes from red to uh, ultraviolet. So <clears throat> what you can do is you can take the frequency of a color, and then you can work out what its corresponding musical key is by basically just going down the octaves. So light frequency is very fast, sound frequency is very slow. So you divide by two, divide by two, divide by two, and you can get the frequencies of sound corresponding to those lights. So, so the first color in the, in the color spectrum is red, and that corresponds with the key of G. Um, in fact, if you take the classical rainbow, the seven colors of the rainbow, red, orange, yellow, and blue, that's G major. That's the scale of G major. So you know, if you just play G major on keys, you know, you'll hear it's a very happy scale. It's like the, rain, the rainbow scale. Um, <coughs> OK, so in the, in, in 432 tuning, and I know a lot of people, there's been a lot of resistance and a lot of shit said about 432, but it's, it's totally legit. I mean, like, the, <coughs> the, 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 the difference is, really, that the 432 tuning system is a natural harmonic series that is built into the numbers that are given to us by God, right? The numbers. We didn't invent the numbers. It's like, it's like, Before. yeah, yeah. So, we have this no, these numbers one to nine. They're amazing things, very mysterious, and they they seem to transcend space and time, exist outside of space and time. Um, and within that number series, there is a perfectly harmonic musical scale with all these like wonderful, memorable magic numbers. Now, what people have done with 440 is that they've they've shifted slightly, and then they calculate all the notes based on the root note of A440. But they're all irrational numbers, right? Do you know what I mean by that? Just be yeah, because of the equal temperament. Yeah, it's yeah so it's the, the, the twi yeah, yeah. Well, the, this, so, but, but, but in, a, in a digital sense, so you've got A, which is 440, and then every other frequency other than A 
is just a, an irrational number with an infinite number of decimal places and no repeating patterns, right? Which is the antithesis of harmony. It's the very definition of disharmony. But it's close enough, you know, it's done in such a way that it's close enough that our music sounds good, you know, I'm not, I'm not knocking 440 music. All the music I ever listened to and loved was in 440. But um, the scale is a set of irrational numbers, um, which uh, irrational numbers are, they have no repeating patterns. That means that there's no harmony in them at all. Um, they, they can't be expressed as a ratio of numbers. Whereas in the 432, there, there are all these, these beautiful numbers. So the, the key of G, for example, is 48 hertz. Um, so we can see that the octaves on the outside there, we've got 48, 96, 192, 384. And then we can go down the octaves and we get the, essentially the brainwave frequencies, okay? So the brainwave frequencies run from about you know, one, one hertz up to about uh, 30 or 40 hertz, you know, however high you want to go. So when we divide by two, we get 24 hertz, 12 hertz, 8 hertz, uh, sorry, 6 hertz and 3 hertz. Um, now, if we go down in frequency again, we can get the tempo of the key of G, which is also the tempo of the color of red. Um, and that's 90 BPM or 180 BPM. Now, <clears throat> the whole cycle, because the octave is a cycle, it can be synced with any other type of cycle, any other sine wave, OK? So I've taken the, the, the cycle of the day, starting at dawn, 6 AM, when the sun comes up, Aries, arise um, as the dawn, the spring equinox, start of the year, March 21st. And then we go through, and I've, I've mapped it all the way through. So we, we get basically frequencies corresponding with times of day, frequency corresponding with times of the year, frequency corresponding with the zo zodiacal um, signs, um, and you know, exact frequencies. <coughs> so um, <coughs> for that tune, it was in E minor at 150 BPM. And that was chosen because I started it in Capricorn. Um, and if you look over here in Capricorn in January, it's the key of E, and 40, 80, 160, 320, and 150 or 75 BPM. So I was, you know, I was like, OK, it's winter, it's Capricorn, it's January. What am I, what am I going to do musically? All right, I'm like, OK, well, Capricorn is E. Uh, yeah, 150 BPM. So I started then, so as to reflect the time of year that, that, that I was in. Um, so yeah, and, and there's just all kinds of like beautiful um, numbers and all this. Uh, the number nine plays a very important role in the harmonic series. A lot of things just add up to nine. Um, there's a lot of interesting correspondences with geometry. So like, if you take the G, for example, which is the start of the circle, Right. You know there's 360 degrees in a circle. Well, the key of G is 360 BPM. You see, you look, it's 90, 180, and then the, double, the next octave is 360. So the start of the circle is 360 BPM, and then you go all the way around, you get to F sharp, and the frequency of F sharp is 360 hertz. So you get the 360 three times uh, in, in one place at the completion of the circle. And um, yeah, there's all these numbers that add up to nine and stuff. Uh, it's pretty, pretty, pretty cool. Um, so yeah, this, this has been really useful. Um, and um, you know, there's a lot, of, a, a lot of stuff in here. And like, how you work with it you know, is kind of uh, completely up to you. But um, yeah, it's, just, it's the, the art of correspondence, you know, of like finding resonance between things. You know? So I'm not saying that the color red is equal to the key of G. I'm just saying like G corresponds to the color red. You know, there's a, a, a whole number of numerical relationship between the two, uh, or you know, vice versa. So it's all it's all correspondence. It's about resonance. It's not about equality. You know, I'm not saying that E is January. You know, it's just yeah. There's a resonance between the key of E and the month of January. You know, and yeah, that, that's kind of how it works. It's, it used to, I think it used to be called the art of memory. So it's a way of relating all the things in the sky and on the earth and in the body all together using this, this, this kind of approach. Uh, sometimes called syncretism, S-Y. Uh, yeah, syncretism, yeah. OK, two questions. Uh -huh. uh, first question, do you play your sets like this? Like, do you actually choose the music according to the time of year, time of day? No, um, no, my sets. I, I don't. I don't plan my sets, um, uh, but I, um, you know, I just try to feel out the, the situation that I'm in and choose <laughs> choose the right track. You know, one after another. You know, I don't. I don't usually go in with any kind of set idea about what I'm going to play. 
it's just a case of like choosing my first track or maybe the first two tracks. I'll be like, okay, I'm going to start with those two, and then just go where you know where I need to take it from there. You know. Okay. And the second question is, um, so I've 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 noticed that there's a a, a, a lot of bass in your music. So. Mm. Is there a clear separation between your kick drum and your bass elements, or how do you well, work, work <coughs> around getting the balance between your kick and your bass? Because there's so many different bass elements. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's um, you know, someone said to me years ago that dance music is essentially bass management. Yeah, <laughs> it's just like you're just always just managing the bass. Um, and yeah, I mean that one, you know, this came through super bassy. As I said, I haven't, I haven't mixed it down or whatever. Um, you know, it's just. Um, I would say in the, in the seven steps, that, that track is uh, kind of just out of fermentation, you know, so <laughs> it's still a little bit wet and sticky and just kind of like, uh, uh, but it needs to go through the distillation to get the mix like really tight. But um, yeah, with the bass, I mean, um, you know, just, yeah, keeping, thing, keeping space, you know, I, I kind of like space now, like that, that bass was like only on the one, you know, so it was like, and then space, space, I kind of quite like that, whereas I, I used to, my older stuff was more kind of like humming, you know, it was just like <laughs> um, But now I, I just, I don't know, I don't get on board with that so much. I like to kind of like open up the, the, the beats. Um, uh, and this is a, a bit of a diversion there, but just occurred to me. So, you, you know about like on the, on the gender thing, the masculine and feminine, this correspondence between the, ki the kick and the snare, uh, you know, the, ki the kick is a mas masculine energy and the snare is a feminine energy, you know? You have odd and even, it comes from Adam and Eve, okay, like odd numbers associated with masculine, even numbers associated with feminine. And they've even done experiments where they just, you know, show people numbers and ask them what qualities they associate with it, and people, you know, pretty much universally will associate feminine qualities with even numbers and, you know, masculine qualities with odd numbers. Um, and, uh, yeah, the snare drum, it, the, there's it, lots of interesting correspondences. So the, the shape of the kick, the spectral shape of a kick drum, uh, which kind of you know, starts out with this high frequency, and then kind of comes, it's kind of quiet high frequency, and then gets louder and louder, low frequency, and, and then sort of down. You know, if you look at the light spectrum of the sun, you know, it looks just like that. You know, but it's a different, it's a whole different octave, but it's got the same sort of shape. Where you look at something like the moon which has a different light spectrum, has like structure and like grays and stuff in it, you know, it actually looks more like a snare drum. Um, and of course, the sun and the moon are associated with masculine and feminine as well. And, you know, it, just the more I dig into it, it just everything is just kind of like comes together, you know, where you're just looking at all as, vi as vibra vibration, you know. Um, so everything is sine waves, that's why the sine wave is in the center of the yin yang and in the center of this, because it's the sine wave is the it's the, it's the thing that links the light and the dark, right? So in the middle of the, the dark and the light and constantly like oscillating between the two. Um, and, you know, yeah, I mean, in the biblical, you know, stories, they, they say, you know, the first thing God did was to create the light and the dark, right? <laughs> it's like, it's like the first step of creation, light and dark, um, before anything else, you know? And, uh, yeah, so it's a, a creative system. I say some people said that alchemy is the science with which the universe is made, you know, it's like, uh, you know, this, this is why it's so, so, so secretive, you know, but it's, this, this, some people have this idea of the, the universe as this kind of like alchemical still, you know, we're, we're like, kind of like in this like glass, glass bottle, like undergoing this like process, you know, like heat is being applied, you know, we might be sitting on a shelf in like an alchemist's lab, like the whole earth or whatever, the whole universe, <laughs> yeah, fermenting, and you know, we're all going through these changes, we're having these challenges, you know, got suffering, and there's all the cleaning to be done, you know, like this is, I started to realize this with alchemy, it's all about cleaning and purification at every stage, and then I'm, I'm looking at it, I'm thinking, God, I spend most of my day cleaning, you know, and my wife spends all day cleaning, you know, the kids are just like making a mess all the time, like you, you know, we have all this problem with the oceans being polluted, and you know, I was in Central America for six months, and I mean, the trash, like, there is just, you know, it's hard to imagine how that can ever be fixed, it's just, peop it's just trash, like, all over the place, in the jungles and you know the sides of the roads, people burning trash fires, just like there's so much mess to clean up. It's like wow, and and we're all working just constantly, like managing it and trying to make things better and improving. And it's in a way, it seems like we're all little agents of some grand alchemical process to like make things better, right? <laughs> we really we're trying anyway, but you know we're not all making things better. But um, uh, it, it's kind of like uh, the more you learn about alchemy the more you start to see the world through the lens of alchemy, and it starts to look 
like a kind of alchemical experiment. And you, you get this kind of picture as God, God is kind of like this grand alchemist, you know, who's like, you know, created this, uh, yeah, this mysterious place that we all find ourselves in. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, I mean, I, I you know, I, I wasn't raised religious. I was, uh, my parents were kind of uh, agnostic, if you like, you know, they were just like, oh, we don't really know and we don't want to think about it. Um, <laughs> But it was really through music and through alchemy that I came to have a, a more, um, yeah, a, a more a creationist outlook on the world, you know, um, uh, because it's just alchemy, yeah, just it's just this beautiful system for creating worlds. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, you know, I don't practice alchemy in, a, you know, in the chemical sense, you know, I don't have chemistry set and I don't do much cooking at all. My wife does most of the cooking. But what I love about um, with music is that the alchemy, um, it's, sort of, it's a very clean way to practice alchemy. You can practice the ideas of alchemy, but it's clean because you're working with the air and not with like, you know, salts and liquids and, you know, poisons and things like that, you know, which things can get messy and things can explode and, you know, uh, and whatnot. But, um, musician is doing transformations of the air rather than transformations of the earth. Um, and so it's much cleaner. You can make mistakes, you know, everything can be edited. You know, you can go back if you, if you make, like if you make a bunch of mistakes in alchemy, if you have like some impurity, which you didn't get out in the first few stages and it carries through the latter stages and you've been at it for months or years and you're nearly getting there and the whole thing can just get ruined because you didn't, you know, but with music, it's not like that because it's all digital and we can go back and edit things and clean things up and redo things and undo things. And so it's this beautiful kind of like clean way to practice the ideas of alchemy without making a mess or blowing yourself up or, uh, you know, or whatever. <laughs> uh, the project that we saw now, it's not, uh, it's not already a mixed uh, process. Like we, I saw a lot of compression and EQ and... Uh, yeah, a yeah. bunch of plugins, <laughs> and it's not it's not mixed. No, well, the mix down process for me would involve like kind of turning everything down. So you know, and then and then bring bring it up kind of element by element. You know, from the lowest to the highest, and you know, really kind of taking your time with it. And the compressors and the EQs that you see on there now are more just um, you know, just sound shaping. You know, it's oh, like I've got the sound together. Sound yeah, and I just needed to shape it a little bit. But then once it's all once it's all arranged and all fermented, uh, as it were, then yeah, usually I'll just like bring everything down, and then just you know bit by bit start bringing it in and and, and sort of re-establishing the relationships like between more, all the more sounds. More like volume automation and this uh -huh. kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, volume and you know cleaning up. You know maybe you have, I have sounds that have like longer tails than they need to. You know and. You'll notice that in the mix-down process, once you take everything else down, you'll be like, oh, this is a bit long, I'll so bring that back and make things tighter. So you will export like by the groups, or you will separate each, each track for itself? Um, well, Because uh, when you export in Ableton a group, then it takes all the tracks to one WAV file. So uh, yes, yeah, so I, I usually I would just export it to one WAV file and get it mastered. Um, I, have, I would export groups as well. Um, I don't always do it, um, but I used to do uh, live sets with stems. Um, and uh, uh, we'd export the, the groups, you know, um, and then mix them together and do like live remixing with them. But the, the issue I had with that was um, you were very limited in uh, the, your set. You know, you had to like ha have a planned set from you know one track to the next because you you can't really DJ with stems. Well, not <laughs> at least I couldn't at the time. Um, so I, I didn't like having a fixed set, like because I'm a I'm a DJ. You know, I've been a DJ before longer than a producer and it's important for me to be able to take the music wherever I think it needs to go in that moment. I can't be like fixed yeah. to attract, you know, a, a fixed set list. So, um, so yeah, so sometimes I'll, I'll bring stems in and, you know, play with them, but the main performance is, 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 DJ, is a DJ set. Yeah. One last question. Uh, How do you tune your music to 432? Yeah, because I know that you have in pre uh, preferences Ableton, but it mm -hmm. tunes only the operator and the, the plugins of Ableton. In Serum, I know you have as well. You mm -hmm. can tune, but what do you do with the rest of the stuff like contact or this kind? Yeah, well, most things you can just... It, it's, it's kind of approximate, so... Because you still, you're still having to work with an equal temperament most of the time. So you can, even though you can tune your root note to 432, uh, like in this one, it's tuned to 432, but I'm still in equal temperament, so I'm not getting 
you know, for a lot of keys, I'm not getting these like whole number values that I want to be because I can't actually just choose the frequency of the key. That's what I, all I want to be able to do. I've been asking Ableton this for years. I'm just like, let us choose the frequencies of the notes, please. You know, <laughs> I mean, like, and I got a lot of stick for it as well. It's like, but you know, some guy on a forum just sort of laid into me about it, like, you know, and it's like, no, I mean. I, a musician should be able to like choose the frequencies of his notes. <laughs> you know? you, yeah, you could do it in Max for Live. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's a little bit trickier with uh, things like operator. Um, you have to kind of do it on the on the actual oscillator using the fine tuning. Um, but there's a tuner built into Ableton, so sometimes just use use that if in any any doubt. Um, it's got a it's got a tuner utility here. Um, <clears throat> And then you can just put the reference to 4, 440. You put this one on the master? Uh, no, this is just on a, uh, it's just on an audio track there. Hang on. So let's say on, on this one. Oops. So you see that's kind of like moving around the A432. Um, and that's with, with silence. Um, and yeah, it's just, just with the fine tuning there, you see it's just turned down 32 cents mm -hmm. or thereabouts. <clears throat> yeah. But yeah, it's not true. It's not true 432 because I can't, you can't use the whole number ratios. You still have to use the equal temperament. Yeah. Uh, I have uh, two questions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one about the workflow. Mm -hmm. um, in the beginning, uh, how, you know, like, what is more, impo more important? to compose the, the song or to create the sounds of the song? Hmm. Well, yeah, so you, you can, I mean, you can do it in any order you want. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm actually not terribly prescriptive about, you know, doing it one step at a time. Uh, what I say is that, like, whatever you're doing, you're doing one of those seven steps, whatever order you want to do it. So like you say, you may have instruments which are already calibrated. You know, you've got some synths, you've got piano, so you don't need to build your instruments. You don't need to do much calibration. You're set, you're good to go, so you can just get jamming right away. Um, and maybe you've got an idea for a composition, so you just jam in the composition from scratch, and you're not really doing any filtering or separation. You've just got what you need. You do the composition, you do the editing. Um, or sometimes it'll be like, you build an instrument, you jam with it, you record it, you compose it, you edit it, and then you build another instrument, and then you do it. You know, so <laughs> it's kind of non-linear. You, know, you, you can do it in any order you want. Um, uh, but we, we just taught it in that order because it was, we had a seven-day retreat. So we would devote each day to one of the seven steps. So the first day would be all about sound design and building instruments. And the second day would be all about jamming and just flowing <laughs> and letting go, um, and, and so on and so forth. So it's more about the steps, not uh, like it's not the way to do it, but uh, the ideas you need to go through in order to have a complete product. Yeah, yeah, they're they're like um, as I say, it's like archetypal. They're like archetypal processes, and as I say it doesn't matter if you're making music or doing sculpture or making kombucha or making a curry or <laughs> whatever it is. Like you, you're always going to be doing something of these alchemical steps. Um, you know, again with kombucha, I mean the the, the calcination would be the drying of the tea, right? So like, you've got to pick like, tea and herbs, and then it has to be dried. And that's the application of heat. And it reduces it to its ashes, and then it's like, put in water to make a, 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 a dissolution. You might put some fruit, some like, ginger and stuff in there, and then it dissolves. And then the next step is the separation. You like, take the ginger and the tea bags and all that out, and you're left with it. And then you do the conjunction with the SCOBY. SCOBY goes in, and then ferments it. And then you, act, you don't really distill kombucha, at least I'm not aware of people doing it, but it sort of stops there at that point. And then you've got your ferment, and then you drink it, and it's just heaven. <laughs> Kombucha's my favorite drink, by the way. You know, I yeah, just thought I'd mention that. Um, <laughs> so, <clears throat> OK, so this is uh, a very cut down version of my live set. I used to have, all, you know, this is only my music in here, and just like, a few other bits from friends. But I used to have all my music and all you know, this other music. It was huge. But I thinned it down to just uh, my music and a few other uh, just freshies from friends of mine. Um, now, they're just in there, mastered tracks. I've got three decks, three audio channels. And I've got three uh, custom effects racks that I, I've made to uh, you know, manipulate those, like DJ effects for like mixing and filtering and making risers and uh, using delays and all kinds of things like that. Um, <clears throat> and so I've got it kind of an order of 
tempo pretty much, you know, starting at 90 G, and I've got it color coded. So all the ones that are red are, are G, um, blue is D, you know, just the same as the, the colors that you saw on the, on the chart. Um, <clears throat> and uh, they're kind of going up in tempo. So you see like, from like 90 up there, and then I get to like 130, and this is all, and then I get into like my, my older stuff, like my side breaks and all that. And some of my higher tempo stuff here, like 150, 160 um, BPM stuff. So yeah, so I've got um, basically three decks, um, and I can mix back and forth between those. They are, um, you know, everything's synced. Uh, sometimes not everything. Sometimes I'll play tracks that aren't warped. If they're just kind of a bit weird, they have like a long intro or whatever, I'll just play them unwarped. But generally, everything is warped so that it's all synced to the project clock. And then I can use, you know, I can use things like, uh, you know, these uh, instruments. Let me just plug this in. <coughs> so if I take like Sananga Serenade here. Bit of swing on this. So I can like make, you know, I can make percussion and stuff along with the DJ tracks. I can like create different patterns. Yeah. So, so yeah, like, <laughs> thank you. Um, so yeah, I got just got a few different, few different, different ones that I made and. Um, Sound kind of similar, but they've got different samples and stuff in them. Um, no, I've got other bits here. Um, the, the, those are both like uh, more like traditional percussion sort of sounds, and then I've got one here which is like a kind of textured. Um, So yeah, it's all kind of synced and got all these kind of liquidy effects and so good in like breakdowns and like bass drops and things like that. You can create all this like all this like ripping like liquidy noise. And then yeah, I just I've got a few other a few other things here. Sorry, my playing is not very on form today. I do kind of need to get in the zone with that. I'm not a classically trained like pianist or anything. I learned a bit of piano, but it's like I can play, but I can't. Play, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I, was, uh, I know some people who can play, but they can't play. You know, like people who they'll, they'll like sit there and play back, and they'll be like, "All right, play me something that play me something else that you made yourself." They're like, "I don't know what you mean. I can only play what I learned." You know, like, whereas I can't play any any songs, but I can sit down and just play. You know, and just jam and you know see what comes out. And uh, I think often we're afraid to make mistakes, you know, because you make something sound bad and it's just like, oh, it makes you feel bad and you don't want to do that, but you have to kind of, that's the flow state, you know, you just have to kind of let that go and if it sounds bad, just it's gone, it doesn't matter, keep on, keep on going, make it better. And then, yeah, I've just got some chord swells and stuff in there, so, yeah, just some things to play with. That one's nothing. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so it was actually just uh, some glitch samples. But the, the, the kind of liquidiness, I think, really comes from the, the movement, you know, of the pitch and stuff. Sorry? The frequencies. Um, what? Oh, no, they're not key. So th th these are more kind of like atonal sounds, you know. That, yeah, they were chosen to be uh, atonal, whereas the other ones were chosen. Some of them had like actually, like, boop, you know, leaps so you can like tune it and stuff. But. So it's just basically a bunch of glitch sounds, um, and it's just skipping through them all. And then I've got, I've got some like other, I've got this super liquid thing, which I'm not even sure what it is. I made this ages ago. Oh, it's the grain delay. Yeah, yeah, so. And you can just bring it back more rhythmic. Yeah, so it's just good fun, you know, and it's all synced with the arpeggiator, you know, so as long as your, your tracks are warped and... Uh, what one? The original sound. Uh, yeah, I, as I say, they're just they're just like short. I've got like 128 like short little glitch noises. Yeah, but you know I'll be around. So uh, yeah, if you want to talk to me later or anything, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you guys.